Hello, I, I hope you have made it into the room from the waiting room. Hello. Uh, let me know if you're here in the chat box. Uh, how are you? Where are you joining me from? Whereabouts in the world are you? Oh, Bolivia, how lovely. Okay, I hope you can hear me loud and clear. Let me know if you can hear me. Oh, London, lovely. Love London, miss London. Okay, what a lovely array of countries. And it seems that you can hear me because you're answering my questions. Uh, oh, someone else in Poland. I'm in Poland too. So <laughs> a few of us in the same part of the world. Um, I guess for some of you it's morning, for me it's afternoon. Um, I hope your lessons have gone well if you've finished teaching. Um, and if they're coming up later today, I hope there's some things in the webinar uh, that will help. I want to start with a little bit of housekeeping. Um, if you joined the webinar last week, then you will have already been sent the certificate of attendance. So if you haven't found it in your inbox, check your spam box. Uh, they have been sent. Um, and the certificate of attendance from this webinar will be sent uh, within a week or so. So you will get it again. Keep an eye on your spam box. I think sometimes they disappear into those um, boxes. Um, this is the second in a series of five webinars. Um, the first one was last week. And if you missed it, uh, you can watch it on Pearson's YouTube channel. Um, and I recommend that after this webinar, if you didn't join that first webinar, that you go back and watch it, uh, because that gives them a real good overview of the principles and the theory behind AFL. Um, and uh, today we're going to be looking at um, success criteria and learning intentions or objectives uh, in more detail. Um, and I recommend that you join uh, the upcoming three webinars as well. So every Tuesday uh, for the next three weeks, we'll be having uh, assessment for learning. Uh, webinars. Um, so, hi, yeah, hi, thanks everyone saying hello in the chat box. Um, I'm looking forward to the next hour as well, so thanks for being here. Now, if you don't know me, my name is Amanda, and I'm a teacher and a teacher trainer, and I work mainly with young learners and their teachers, and I'm really happy to be running this uh, series on assessment for learning, because it's something that has really helped me in my classroom. I've seen the benefits myself. Um, and the benefits aren't only for students, they're also for teachers, and that's something I always like to keep in mind because we're so busy and our job isn't very easy. So anything that makes the life of the teacher easier uh, is something that you know, I'm a big fan of. Um, so to kick off, I'm going to share what's coming up, with, uh, coming up in today's webinar. Um, I've actually got some questions. Um, so it would be really nice if you could read the questions and if you can answer any of them, if you have some ideas, let me know in the chat box uh, your thoughts. Uh, so first we're going to be talking about learning objectives, which are also called learning intentions, uh, learning aims, there's a variety of different names that we hear for them. Um, but why should we use them, um, when and how do we use them? And the same for success criteria, when and how do we use success criteria. What do you already know about these two uh, classroom strategies? Learning objectives, Sylvia says, makes planning a lot easier. That's true. It's uh, connected to writing aims, really. And when we write lesson aims, uh, then planning becomes much easier because we know what to throw out uh, and what to focus on. Um, yes, and they certainly help to focus learning from the student's point of view. Uh, they're more able to focus on what's important. Hello, Marina from Argentina. <laughs> and of course, we're talking about assessment for learning, and these are all strategies to help us assess learning, uh, but they also help students to assess their own learning. Um, yes. Uh, uh, yes, in the same way that uh, writing lesson names helps us keep in mind what we should teach. Uh, Natasha, or Natasha, sorry, I don't know how to pronounce your name, says, um, they, they can help us keep in mind what we're doing in the classroom, but students can also focus. Um, okay. And Sandra, I like what you said there, help students know what we expect from them. So throughout this webinar, we're going to be looking at more detail and all of uh, looking in more detail um, to answer these questions. So by the end, you should be able to answer them easy. Um, before I start thinking about those, I just recap quickly uh, some of the key information from last week's webinar. Um, so if you were, if you joined, it's a bit of revision. If you didn't join, it will just give you a, a very quick overview. Um, so the overriding thing to remember about AFL, Assessment for Learning, is that it puts students at the heart of learning. It's not something that teachers do. 
it's something that teachers and students do together. Um, so the students are very much involved. It's driven by the teacher. They're things you have to introduce and take control of. Uh, but it's something that students need to be involved in. Um, and there are a few reasons for that. Um, one reason is that uh, we know that learning is more effective when students understand where they are in their learning. So that means students need to be able to reflect on what they already know, what they need to learn next. Um, and then finally, if they were successful or not in their learning. Another key thing to remember from AFL is that it gives responsibility to the students. Now, we have a really busy job as teachers, and often we feel like we're the centre of everything. We're answering all the questions. We're responsible for everything that happens in the classroom. Uh, but actually, um, students really benefit when they have some responsibility. So a key thing about assessment for learning is putting some of that onto the students. We don't have to be responsible for everything anymore. Uh, we can give some of the responsibility to the students. And finally, assessment for learning is a, a, an approach uh, that really helps every student feel that they are making progress, which I really like. Um, so it's not only that the strong students are getting the good grades and getting all the praise. Assessment for learning makes sure that every student uh, feels progress, feels a sense of achievement, and can take pride in their learning, which is great. It's great for motivation um, for everyone. Um, OK, so there's that's sort of like a very quick uh, background. Um, and now we're going to look a little bit more um, at our first question, which is why use learning objectives. Um, so um, there's plenty of research um, that you can read. It's available online. Um, that proves or summarizes um, the effectiveness of using uh, learning objectives, success criteria, assessment for learning in general. And I'm not going to summarize that research for you today. It's available. Uh, those are two publications that um, I've really uh, found useful. Um, what I am going to do instead is share some of my experiences from the classroom. <laughs> uh, so what happened to me? Um, and I wonder if you ever hear these questions from your students, because I hear them all the time. Let me know in the chat box, do your students ask these questions during lessons? And if so, how do you respond? What do you say? Liliana's first to say yes. OK, I'm glad I'm not the only one. <laughs> Constantly, Natasha says. Um, OK, very often, all the time. So the same as me. They're always asking these questions. Oh, Pedro, not so much. That's good. Uh, how do you respond um, uh, to these questions? How do you respond when students ask you these questions or make these statements? Oh, I'm asking to watch a movie as well. I, I missed that one. That's a really common one, isn't it? OK, so we can ask you to be patient and they will find out. OK, letting them know the next point on the agenda, Sylvia. That's a nice idea. Uh, oh, Armenhi. Sorry about pronunciation of names. Uh, I really like that. So let them know the point of the task. I think that's really important. Um, explaining what you're going to do during the day. Yeah, sometimes it's good. Uh, someone mentioned there, uh, Hilla says, oh, I play a game. Actually, sometimes that's a good idea because it breaks things up, as uh, Hilla mentioned. Um, OK, um, and that's nice, Marina. So if students tell me they already know a topic, challenge them to tell you what they know to finish the topic faster. And that's something that we're going to be talking about um, today. Um, so. Um, I actually think these questions are very valid. Um, I used to be frustrated when I heard them, particularly when I just posed an interesting question or set up a nice task. I used to be frustrated, but the more I've thought about it, the more valid I think these questions are. Because it's only natural that you want to know what's happening in your life, what's coming up. When we go to a meeting, uh, we usually have some sort of minutes. We know what is on the agenda for the meeting. Uh, when we're planning our work days, uh, we write to-do lists. I love writing a to-do list because I always put some easy things on there that I can tick off straight away. Uh, there's something really nice about um, knowing that you're moving through tasks and you're heading towards the end point. Uh, we plan our free time. Um, it's only natural to want to know what the expectations are and what you're going to be doing. And it's quite unusual to be in a situation where you have no idea what's coming up. 
And it's the same for our students. If they know what's coming up in the lesson, and this is what some of you mentioned, if they know what's coming up, if they know what sort of things they're going to be learning about, they're less likely to ask these questions. And I use learning objectives as a way to share this crucial information uh, to reduce the number of these questions, uh, but there are also other benefits. And to think about the benefits, I want to think about each question in turn. Um, so the first question, how long until the end of the lesson? Now that tends to be asked by younger students uh, who maybe aren't so good at uh, telling the time, or older students who are not wearing a watch, but it can also be asked by students who are just not very good at time management. If we've shared with the students what's coming up in the lesson, so more or less uh, what the main stages are, what's coming first, second, third, it means the students can keep track of where they are in the lesson, where they are in their learning. And so they, they feel a bit more uh, secure that they're moving through the stages uh, towards the end point. Um, it also gives the students some sort of control because they know what's going to be happening. They don't have to ask. They don't have to rely on the teacher. And teenagers uh, love to be in control. They love to be independent and have autonomy and to be trusted. Um, so letting them know what's coming up means that they, they know where they are in the lesson. Uh, so they can judge pretty much. Um, how much longer it's going to take before they get to run out the door. Uh, what are we doing next? I think uh, students often ask this when they're not particularly enjoying the task that they're supposed to be doing. And that's natural. However hard we try to please all our students and appeal to their uh, learning uh, preferences, it's impossible to please everyone all the time. Some students are going to enjoy one activity, uh, others are going to prefer another. Um, if we've let the students know that first they're going to be learning some vocabulary, uh, in the next stage they're going to read a text, and finally they're going to, uh, let's say, create a storyboard uh, to reflect that text, then it means that students can. Oh, sorry. It means students um, who are maybe like, who are very creative and love drawing can look forward uh, to the final stage when they've got a creative task. There might be students who really enjoy learning vocabulary and playing with new vocabulary. Um, there are some students who love reading. Um, knowing what's coming up in a lesson means students can look forward to the things uh, that they know they enjoy. Uh, it also highlights to them the things uh, that they find more challenging. So it can, we can use that as a way to motivate them to work harder in those stages. Uh, so it's a good way to help them identify their strengths. Um, and it's a good way to break the lesson down into stages. So again, students know that they're moving through the stages to the end point. Um, Ruta, that's a good point. The best lesson is when students aren't waiting for the end of the lesson. And it does happen sometimes, doesn't it? But unfortunately, it doesn't happen every lesson, however good we are as teachers. Uh, what's the point? Um, this question is annoying. Um, we always have a reason for doing something in the classroom. Otherwise, we would just blindly follow course books, which we don't do. We adapt, we supplement, uh, we bring in different tasks from, different, um, from online, from different resource books. Um, because we have a reason for teaching something, we know what our students need to learn, we know their strengths and their weaknesses. And learning intentions uh, bring students in on this information. Um, they uh, can help students reflect on the things they already know, um, they can focus on where they need to go next, what they need to learn, and they have a much clearer idea of how to improve. Um, so if we don't let students know why we're doing something, then they don't understand the point. Um, so it's a really good idea to tell them. Playing games is good, but of course we can't play games all the time. Um, but I think if we let students know what's coming up in the lesson, if they know that there's something playful or something relaxing um, or something that they really enjoy coming up, I think it does a couple of things. It reassures them that the teacher cares and is thinking about them and is planning things for them that they're going to enjoy. Um, it helps them focus on a stage that is maybe more relaxing for them. Um, I think it takes some of the stress out. So if they know what's going to happen, they're less stressed about when is the game, what's the game going to be, whose team am I going to be on. Actually, the students know it's already planned. Uh, the webinar is being recorded and it will be sent to you um, via email uh, and it will also be on Pearson's YouTube channel. Uh, and finally, uh, teenagers in particular uh, think they know it all. They think they know everything. And sometimes they do. They often surprise me by knowing more than I think they know. 
uh, but the chances are they don't know everything. Uh, when we share learning objectives, and when students discuss them and we listen carefully to what they're saying, uh, we can find out exactly what the students know so we can avoid going over things they already know and we can focus on the things that they don't know. Um, I think uh, this question we get quite often when we're teaching a language like English and you encounter the same structures at different levels. Uh, let's say you've got a lesson with your uh, B2, uh, B1 students on the uh, first condition. I say, well, we did this last year and we did it the year before. Um, probably they did, but how are you building on that knowledge? So get the students to tell you what they already know and then show them what they don't know and reassure them that that's why you are doing it. You're not just making them revise something that they already know, uh, but you're showing them the new aspect or the new thing that they're going to be getting from the lesson. So to put it simply, learning objectives help students to focus on what they already know, what they need to learn next, and why it's important for them to learn it. Um, okay, so what makes a good learning objective? Um, first of all, I wonder if you can tell me which is the correct uh, answer here, A or B. Learning objectives show what students will be learning, or what students will be doing, which is correct, A or B? A little bit of disagreement here. OK, so um, the learning objectives that we share with our students should focus on what the students will be learning. In the same way, when we write our lesson aims, we don't want to write what the students will be doing. That's the procedure. So that's what, when we write our plan, that's when we write down, OK, the students will work with a partner. They will look at page 42. They'll answer the questions. That's what they will be doing. But the learning objectives, like our lesson aims, should focus on what the students will be learning. So A is the correct answer here. I'm going to give you some examples of learning, uh, learning objectives in a moment uh, that focus on this learning rather than on the doing. Um, one thing that has helped me to get better at writing learning objectives is using this uh, acronym SMART, which sort of comes from a business context, uh, but it's quite useful. Um, Pedro, a learning objective and a learning out, yes, is the same thing. We have, and I keep saying learning intentions as well today, learning intentions, learning objectives, learning outcomes, learning aims, lesson aims, learning aims, they're all the same thing. Um, so, um, going back to our SMART objectives, um, well done, so um, Olga uh, got there first, uh, so they need to be specific. Um, so a specific learning objective uh, would be something like, I can uh, write 10 words related to uh, the environment. Um, so we want to say how many words, what the context is. Um, a a non-specific learning objective would be, uh, we're going to learn some words about nature. It's not very specific. What's the M? Oh, you've already got there, I think. I'll go as first again. So measurable. Again, uh, if we just say, oh, we're going to learn some grammar, okay, well, what grammar, how much of it uh, are we thinking about meaning, pronunciation, form, uh, so we need to be specific with what aspects um, of the language or the vocabulary or the skills we'll relate to. Um, you've got attainable, it's, well, um, attainable is not what I've got, but it's sort of similar. Um, so I've got achievable. Um, so we don't want a huge learning objective such as, oh, we will, we will finish A2 level. Uh, a learning objective uh, should be for a, a lesson or a, a, a short series of lessons. Uh, don't worry that you're late. Thanks for joining. Um, R, realistic is a really good uh, idea, Ronnie, and, and it could well be uh, realistic, but it's not. Um, relevant. So uh, Evgenia was there first. So they need to be relevant to your students. It needs they, they need to relate to their lives and uh, show them how they are going to gain something from it. And the last one, uh, which I think Evgenia also got, time related, 
restricted or time bound. So again, um, I would say for language learning, then a learning objective uh, for one lesson or a couple of lessons uh, is best. If it's too long into the future, uh, then students, it, it's, it's too vague. Um, it's much better to have goals that are small and manageable than one massive goal for the whole semester. So thinking about that, which of these would be the smart learning objective, A or B? We're going to learn some health vocabulary, or I can list 12 words to describe symptoms to a doctor. Of course, it's B, OK? So we know how many words. Uh, we know the context. It's going to see the doctor, um, and it's talking um, symptoms. Uh, in A, um, I uh, would say the word learn is quite difficult. Because we can't ever guarantee learning. Um, we can try, we hope our students learn something in lessons, but we can't really measure it. Um, what did they what what did they learn? Can they do they know the meaning? Can they say it? Can they use it in a sentence? So it's not very specific. In B, they're going to be writing the words. So that's things like spelling, um, uh, prepositions that go around the words. Uh, these form items. And so we know that they're going to be writing them down. So B is the smart learning objective. And in A, learn for me is not very smart. We can't guarantee it. And there are some verbs that help to write smart or specific learning objectives and some which are to be avoided. From this list, which ones do you think should be avoided? Which ones are um, less actionable and more vague? There are a few verbs in there which I would recommend avoiding. Enjoy is definitely wide, uh, Al Sherry. Um, uh, know as well. Again, we can't guarantee that someone will know something. Enjoy, we want students to enjoy learning, but again, they, they're not going to enjoy everything. Uh, we can't ensure. Of course, be aware of is uh, very difficult to measure. Uh, master, Maria's added another one there that I can add to my list for the for next time. Yeah, to master something, what does that mean? Um, okay, this isn't a definitive list. Uh, if you go online, there are plenty of lists, and it's not black and white. So it's not that you mustn't use these. Uh, but for me, there are some that I find they're much harder uh, to, to, to be specific and measurable and relevant. Um, so knowing something, as you mentioned, learn is tricky, enjoy. Practice uh, depends on the aim of the lesson. Maybe it's a revision lesson. Uh, maybe you're not introducing new, um, new language. Uh, maybe it's revision and then practice is OK. Um, because uh, perhaps someone's asked a question, I don't understand why not practice. Because practicing is something that you do. Um, so it's describing what the students are going to be doing. They're going to be practicing. It's not describing what they're going to be learning. So a learning objective should always keep the learning um, in mind. Enjoyment is not so easy to measure, though. No. And also, I think we have to remember that enjoyment isn't a sign of a good lesson or a bad lesson. Some, some lessons I've taught have been not great teaching, but the students enjoyed it. Uh, so, you know, it's a, it's a tricky one. Um, students might love a lesson where, you know, everything goes wrong. Who knows? Um, I'm not sure if I missed any questions there. How do you measure a discussion? I, th I think measuring a discussion is through very careful monitoring. Um, and I'm also, when we move on to talk about success criteria, I'm going to show you how students can reflect on discussions as well. Um, yes, it's tricky to monitor every single discussion if students are working in pairs, but if students can self-reflect and we can monitor carefully, we can still um, gather some information. But again, you need to choose what works for your students and your context. If you've got a very big group, then maybe uh, measuring a discussion is very challenging. OK, if I miss any questions, please ask me again at the end or keep typing them because I'm sort of talking and I'm probably missing some questions as we go through. So I'm not ignoring you. I probably didn't see it. So just keep asking me. Um, OK. Um, so um, how and when do we use learning objectives? These are some learning objectives from a recent lesson that I taught. Uh, so it was a 90-minute lesson. I had three learning objectives. You don't have to have three. It could be one or two. Uh, three is probably maximum. Um, but my um, objectives uh, for this one, I can name 10 endangered animals. 
I can identify the features of a paragraph and I can write a paragraph giving my opinions about Zooms. So when you're doing a lesson, would you focus on these learning objectives? Let me know in the chat box. Uh, Christina, I'll come back to your question in a moment. Okay. So yes, definitely at the end for reflection, and a couple of you have mentioned the beginning as well. So we need to focus on learning objectives uh, at the towards the start of a lesson and at the end of the lesson. Um, I don't do it right at the start of my lessons because there's always latecomers. So I usually have my I usually start with some revision, uh, with checking homework, and I have my uh, usual routines at the very start of the lesson. And then after that, I would introduce my uh, learning objectives. And I usually write them on the board or I project them if I've got a screen. And I give students some discussion questions, which depending on their level, they can do in English or in their mother tongue. It's fine either way, depends on their level. Um, but I would challenge students to tell me, discuss and share their ideas, what they already know. So they could reassure, or, uh, explain to each other, check with each other, as an endangered animal, how many can you name? So I had 10 in mind and it turned out they knew some of them. Um, so as they were telling me the ones they knew, I, I knew that when I was teaching my vocabulary, there were some that were brand new that I would need to focus on in more detail. And there were some that were revision uh, that was just to check that the pronunciation was fine and the spelling. Um, I asked them to discuss the common features of a paragraph. Um, the lesson involved analysing a paragraph, thinking about the topic sentence, the supporting information and a summary sentence. Um, so I asked students about uh, these things. And then I also think it's really good if you're doing writing, uh, get them to think back at, about the last time they did writing. Because my students tend to make the same mistakes over and over again. And it's really frustrating because I feel like I'm giving the same feedback over and over again. Uh, but if you get them to get that last bit of writing, get that last paragraph they wrote, um, and um, have a think about what they didn't do so well then or what they found difficult, uh, then that helps them uh, with the next uh, with the, the task that they're about to do. Um, and as you mentioned quite rightly, we need to return to them at the end of the lesson. Um, ending the lesson with learning objectives is a really great way to summarize learning. Um, so draw students' attention to them again. Hey, look, okay, so uh, there's some questions. What are the new words? Tell me the 10 animals you learned. Well done, you learned 10 new words today. Okay, remind me, what are the features of a paragraph? What's a topic sentence? Um, getting them to reflect on their paragraph. So again, some discussion questions, which get them to focus on how much they did in the lesson and get them to revise what has been covered. These uh, learners, uh, and it's great for self-reflection and peer reflection. So students can chat together about what went well, uh, what they can do better. Um, uh, you mentioned, I think that Olga mentioned, it's great for writing them on the board for latecomers. Uh, another reason why I like to have them on the board is that because we, is that, sorry, <laughs> trying to speak too fast. Another reason I like having them on the board is that as we move through, as we finish uh, lesson stages, we can tick them off, uh, which is really nice for students. It's quite motivating for them to see that they're moving through the lesson and, and what they're achieving and what they're learning. Um, Okay, so these uh, learning objectives uh, relate to um, uh, vocabulary and writing. Somebody asked about structures, um, so we can also use them for, for structures. If you're teaching teenagers, uh, which I think uh, is a really good age group for uh, learning objectives, uh, if you're teaching teenagers, then you can maybe use some uh, meta language. Uh, so you can even say, okay, well, uh, I, I can use the present perfect. Uh, to talk about past experiences, or um, I can talk about wishes and regrets in the past, and that lesson would be about third conditional. Um, if they're younger students, then maybe I can ask and answer question using did. So then we don't necessarily use this sort of meta language that they don't know yet. 
Um, so we can also use it for um, grammar structures as well. Older students who know the names of structures, well, we can use that in the learning objective. Younger students maybe give an example. Um, I can say what foods I like and don't like, or I can ask my partner question about foods I like and foods I don't like. Uh, Ronnie, they're the same. Learning objectives, learning outcomes, the same. Thank you, Pedro, for answering the question. <laughs> I didn't miss that one. Um, OK. Um, now, my learning objectives that I just shared with you are can-do statements. I like using can-do statements, but you don't have to use can-do statements. Um, you can uh, give students a list of things to do. So today, we will read and answer true and false questions. Today, we will design a poster. Uh, or more like what we are learning. So here, it's more like a list of things that are coming up, or a menu. Uh, you could even call it a lesson menu. Um, so again, here, it's just broken down into um, vocabulary, grammar, speaking. Um, so it's giving students uh, just an idea of what's coming up. Uh, for me, the more specific, uh, the better. If a list works for you, then fine. Maybe with young learners, uh, maybe with primary learners, a list um, is also fine. Um, what you put on the board um, is always backed up by the questions you ask. Um, so here, vocabulary is health and sickness. You can still ask students to discuss and tell you which words do you know about health and sickness. Uh, how do you give advice? So again, it's up to you. The form works for your students. Um, if you're unsure about writing learning objectives, uh, there are some tools that you can use. For example, Pearson's Global Scale of English includes a whole section on young learners, um, which is really useful. You can add it online. It's free to download um, and access. And it has uh, learning objectives ready-made uh, for listening, speaking, reading, and writing. All you need to do is find the ones that um, suit your um, context. Um, and you'll also find that in some uh, course books, um, so I use Pearson's uh, course Go Getter, and the teacher's book comes with ready to go learning objectives, learning intentions, which is great. Um, so, um, yeah, there are ready made options. Uh, GSE stands for Global Scale of English. So it's an international or a global scale of measuring uh, where students are. Um, thank you, Monica, for answering. I think you got there before me. <laughs> uh, so yeah, the Global Scale of English, you can check it on Pearson's website, and it has uh, ready-to-go learning objectives for young learners. Uh, there is no C in the Global Scale of English. Uh, maybe you're thinking about some standardized exams in the UK. I'm not sure. OK, moving on then to success criteria. If learning objectives are the what students are going to do, um, then success criteria are the how. Uh, focus on the, the whole lesson. Success criteria focus on um, success criteria focus on a particular task. You don't have to use them for every task. Uh, you need to decide when to use them, but they work particularly well for writing and speaking tasks. I don't know about you, but often with written tasks and speaking tasks, my students just try and finish as quick as they possibly can, um, put their hand up, say we're done, uh, and often they haven't done as well as they could have done. So success criteria give very clear ingredients um, for what students need to uh, do in a task. So here's an example. Uh, the task was a writing task, and it was to write an adventure story. And the success criteria were, I will be successful if people enjoy reading my story. I think that's really important, because communicative competence uh, is what we're all aiming for. Uh, but often, students writing in class, they're not actually writing for any audience. They're just writing for the teacher. And I don't think they really care. My, I don't think my students care if I enjoy reading their stories or not. Uh, but if we help them to focus on the reader and uh, let them know that they are actually going to read each other's stories, um, then it can help them put more effort in. Uh, so I think that's a nice success criteria. 
Um, the students from this group, uh, they've been looking at stories and um, breaking them down into a beginning, a middle and an ending. So they knew they needed these three phases. Um, and we'd also analyze um, um, stories uh, and thought about adjectives to describe characters and surroundings, so making the uh, writing really descriptive, and then to write 200 or 250 words. Now, so the criteria should relate to what students have been learning. They can be about language or skills or both. Um, so again, it's whatever your students have been working on. So maybe you've been working on uh, speaking and showing interest, so that might be a success criteria. Or maybe you've been working on, again, the present perfect, and the success criteria asks students to use the present perfect. Now, as you can see, there are uh, check boxes there. Um, so success criteria should be established before students do the task. After they do the task, students can reflect and decide how well uh, they achieved the criteria. Now, I think I mentioned already um, that success criteria, uh, the AFL puts students at the heart of learning. Uh, we want to make them the center of the classroom. So success criteria shouldn't be set by the teacher. Of course, the teacher needs to have an idea in mind of what success criteria should be, but they should be negotiated and established with the students. Um, and a good way to do this is with a model text. So you show the students the model text, uh, they analyze it, they look at the features of the model text, and then you discuss with the students what they think they need to do uh, to be successful. So here is a model text. It's a postcard. I wrote it. Uh, it's a postcard from me to my grandma and grandpa. Um, have a quick read through. There's some clues there with some highlighting. Uh, but what language uh, do you think I would like my students to focus on in this writing? Past simple. Yeah, OK. Um, very good. Um, so what I did um, with any model text, um, first we want students to read it uh, just for general understanding. So they need a couple of gisty comprehension uh, type questions. Uh, so most students read the postcard and answered the questions. Was, is the holiday good? Uh, what's the writer doing tomorrow? And then I asked students, uh, I gave them a little key um, to color code uh, the useful language in the text. We'd been studying past simple. So I asked students to color the past simple verb. So the strong adjective blue, we'd been learning some different uh, descriptive adjectives. Uh, so in this text, we've got exhausted and huge, freezing. Um, and then to color useful phrases in green, which we'd also studied. Things like dear or to, uh, wish you were here, I'm having a super time. Uh, so students ready for comprehension, and then they identified these parts of the text, which meant they were then ready to discuss the success criteria. I asked my students what they thought uh, they needed to do to be successful. Um, and we came up together uh, with these success criteria. So it was quite easy for them. They just colored in all the past simple verbs yellow, so they knew that they would be successful if they used the past simple. Of course, there's other tenses in there, but they weren't my priority because they weren't some, the, the other tenses weren't things that I um, studied recently with the students. So if they used them, great. If they made mistakes with them, OK, it doesn't matter because it's not my main priority. Uh, so we agreed to use the past simple. They agreed, agreed to use five strong or descriptive adjectives. They knew they had to use the useful phrases uh, for writing a postcard and to draw a picture. Um, so these were established before the students wrote the postcards. Uh, they could refer to them while they were writing their postcards. I put them on the board. Um, sometimes I ask them to copy them into their notebooks. Um, and then at the end of the writing task, uh, they went back and had a look and ticked the criteria that they'd achieved. 
Uh, very useful for fast finishers. There's always someone who finishes way too quickly, and usually they haven't done as well as they could do. Um, so it's great for fast finishers. Get them to look at the success criteria and then go back uh, to the postcard to improve it. Uh, we can also differentiate the success criteria. So we can say, OK, use five to seven strong adjectives. So if a strong student finishes first, you can ask them how many adjectives, five. OK, add two more. So we can differentiate a little bit. Uh, we could ask students to write between 150 and 180 words. Again, then we can challenge uh, stronger students or fast finishers to add a little bit more to do even better. Uh, we can also use success criteria for speaking tasks. This is a find someone who, um, and it's practicing um, has or have and uh, past participles, so present perfect. What would be some useful success criteria for this speaking task? Use the present perfect, yeah, of course. What often happens when I do a find someone who with teenagers or young learners, they just go around saying, has been to Italy, has won a competition, hasn't been to the dentist, and they don't even bother making the questions. Um, so yeah, so to correctly use the present perfect. What would be another? OK, question forms, yeah, would, could definitely be um, a success criteria depending on uh, what you've been teaching in recent lessons. What else? Yeah, something about interaction, because um, young learners, they often don't have this very natural um, interaction. They just go quick, straight from one student to another, asking the questions. They don't show any interest. They don't ask any follow-up questions. So yeah, something about more natural communication and interaction is really good. Find two people. That's a really nice way to extend it for the stronger students. Um, OK, it could be something to do with intonation as well. Um, here are the success criteria uh, that my students came up with. Um, so we had been contrasting present perfect and past simple. Um, so as you said, ask questions using the present perfect. And then I wanted them to ask follow up questions using the past simple. Because again, that's natural communication. I think when you teach adults, and they ask a question and someone answers yes, then it's quite natural. You know, if I ask someone, have you been to Italy? And they say yes, my natural reaction, oh, wow, where did you go? Where and how was it? Whereas young learners will often just go, OK, good, tick, tick, cross, cross, move on. Um, so another criteria to get them to make the most of the speaking task and to extend their speaking was to ask follow up questions using the past simple. Um, I wanted them to show interest in their partners, in their classmates' answers. Um, it's just natural, and I think it's something that a lot of students, younger students, need to work on. And I also challenge them to speak to five different people, or at least five different people, um, because sometimes they can be reluctant. You know, boys only speak to boys, or girls only speak to girls, and they just stay in their little uh, friendship groups. But I challenge them uh, to speak to a range of different people. And I found when I started using success criteria for speaking tasks, the students got a lot more out of it. When I don't set success criteria, sometimes the speaking task is over in about 30 seconds uh, because the students have just taken the fastest route uh, to finishing. Um, whereas success criteria uh, makes students stop and think about what they need to do to be successful um, and gives them uh, more, uh, more of a challenge. Um, so yeah, there's plenty of nice ideas for other tasks there. Speak to five to eight classmates is nice. Again, it's differentiating. Um, uh, talking for a minute as well is a useful one. So if you uh, set like a discussion task uh, or a debate or something, you might give a time limit in the success criteria. Now, we usually use them for speaking and writing tasks. And you certainly don't have to use them for every single task that you do because there isn't really time. But they are useful for if you think about the stages of your lesson, usually you're heading towards one um, big um, activity or culmination, uh, a project or um, a speaking task. Um, so it's, they're really good for those activities that you really want students to get some solid practice of language or skills. But we can also use them for uh, receptive skills, reading and listening. 
um, assessment for learning um, calls for students to be more autonomous and independent, um, which means that the teacher doesn't always have to be there every step of the way, holding their hands, uh, reminding them what to do. We assess criteria to let student, get students to take more responsibility uh, for the whole task. So success criteria for reading uh, might be read the text once to get a general understanding, read it more carefully to look for the answers. Underlining the answers in the text is a great strategy, um, particularly thinking about the increasing a number of exams that students take um, and guessing the meaning of new words as well is a really important strategy for being more autonomous and more independent. The teacher's not always there to explain the meaning of new words, uh, so students need to get good at guessing. Okay, so... Um, how and when do we use success criteria? I think I've already covered this a little bit. Uh, but success criteria need to be elicited from students before they do a task. And they need to be able to see them. So you can write them on the board or students can note them down in their notebooks. Uh, but again, it's not for every task. It's for the most important task. Uh, maybe one per lesson, one, per, one task per two lessons. And a model is very helpful. You can give students a good model. My postcard was a good model, so students can look at it and decide why it was successful. But it could also be a bad model, so you could give them a version that's not very successful and the students read it and decide why it wasn't successful or what went wrong. Um, a model can be spoken, so if you want students uh, to, to talk for one minute, about something well you can talk for one minute on your subject first and they can listen and decide what did you do well what could you do better and for written tasks we would give a written model after students have finished the task uh, they then use the success criteria on their work um, i encourage them to discuss with a partner and look at each other's work because that gives them a better idea of how they're doing compared to their peers. And they can mark using symbols um, or color, uh, traffic light colors. Uh, so on the left there, there's uh, green for I did it really well, orange, I'm not sure, red, I could do it better. The smiley faces on the right. If you've got older teenagers, then tick and cross and question mark is probably the recommended technique. Um, rather than, oh, maybe they like emojis, but tick, cross, question mark um, also works really well. Um, so as I mentioned, they're really good for self-reflection and peer reflection, but it's also really useful for us teachers. Sometimes when I uh, set a writing task, um, the students work on it, they do their best, they hand it in, and the marking can be a real challenge because what to focus on you know, they've made attempts, they've used all sorts of different language and vocabulary. Actually, if you've given success criteria, that can help you to focus your feedback. And you can decide, right, I'm going to give them feedback um, on the success criteria. If they've done something else particularly well, I will focus on it. But if they've attempted to use some structures that you haven't taught, OK, well, you can let them go, because what you're interested in is the success criteria, the things that you told them to focus on. Um, so really helpful when it comes to marking. Also, if students are doing a speaking task and you're listening and you're monitoring and you're thinking, oh, what sort of feedback shall I give them? Again, you can focus just on those success criteria. That's what you're interested in. That's what's important in the lesson. And that's what you can give students feedback on. Um, Assessment for learning strategies, they can be quite tricky sometimes in, to do in English if students are low level. There's nothing wrong with asking students to discuss these strategies in their mother tongue um, because, of course, you will then have a, a, a feedback session uh, when you can help students to reformulate their ideas in English. Um, so um, for Erica, for me, um, it's better to, if the students are a, a high enough level to do it in English, then do it in English. But if they're a low level or they're very, um, they, they lack a bit of confidence or they're very shy, uh, then maybe with their partner they can discuss in L1. Uh, when you then elicit from the group, um, then you can ask them to try in English and then you can help them to say it in English. If they can't say it in English, it's better to say it in their mother tongue uh, rather than not do it. Uh, because it's an effective strategy. But of course, it depends where you work. And there are some schools that are 
a little bit um, against um, L1 in the classroom. Um, so it, you need to be careful about where you are working. But for me, um, a couple of lesson stages in L1 uh, that are helping the students to improve uh, because they can't do it in English uh, is really great. And as they get more confident, uh, you can encourage them more and more to do it in English. Um, okay, so I hope I've answered uh, these questions. I hope you know why to use them, avoiding all those annoying questions. Like, what's the point? We already know it. Uh, we've thought about smart learning intentions, learning objectives, so that they're specific and measurable and relevant. Um, learning objectives I would use, I use lessons. Sometimes I skip and then the students are always saying, well, where are the, what are we doing? <laughs> What's happening in the lesson? Uh, so the students enjoy, um, uh, enjoy knowing what's coming up. And the same for success criteria. Um, essentially, they are an extension of instructions, uh, but it's uh, a way of getting students to self-assess and focus on their own uh, progress. Um, and uh, again, uh, for me, it's really extended the amount of effort uh, that students put particularly into speaking um, and uh, writing tasks. Um, okay, if you have any questions, uh, let me know now in the chat box. There'll be another webinar next Tuesday. There'll be one in the morning, one in the afternoon, European time. Uh, we'll be talking about monitoring progress and informative feedback next week. You can sign up via the link. Um, you will get an email. As I said at the start, I'll, I'll say it again. You will get um, an email. Uh, check your spam boxes because it might have gone in there. But uh, you will get um, a certificate of attendance from this uh, record a uh, certificate of attendance from this webinar and a recording of this webinar sent to you via email. Um, thank you so much for joining. I hope some of the tips are useful. It can take a little while to implement these strategies, so don't try and do everything all at once. Maybe try a learning objective in the next lesson, a couple of success criteria in the one after. Um, so thank you so much. Thank you for your participation as well. And uh, 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 sharing all your knowledge in the chat box. Thank you so much, and I hope to see you next Tuesday at the same time. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Oh, Tom, don't worry that you were late. You can watch the start on YouTube or uh, via the recording we'll send. So don't worry. Okay. All right, then. Thanks. Bye-bye.